Praise God. Let's just prepare just our hearts just to hear God's word this morning. Hallelujah. So, Father, I just thank you, Lord, that this is, Lord, my God, your God-breathed word. Lord, this contains, oh God, Lord, revelations. It contains within it, Lord, Lord, words of faith, Lord, can move mountains. It contains, Lord, miracles. It contains, Lord, instruction for life and wisdom. And so, Lord, as we hear it, O oh God, I pray we, we hear it, O oh God, with a, a sense, O oh God, of seriousness, O oh God. So, Lord, speak to us today, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Second Kings chapter 7, and uh, beginning at verse 1. It says, Then Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time a sea of flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God said and said, Look, if the Lord would make the windows, would make the windows in heaven, this could, could this thing be? And he said, In fact, you will see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And then moving on to verse 3. It says, now there were four leprous men at the gate, at the entrance of the gate. And they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we, sh we, sh and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we will also die. Now, therefore, let it come, let us surrender to the armies of the Assyrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall only die. And they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the armies of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots, a noise of horses, a noise of a great army. So they said to, to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites, the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight. And they left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. And when they, these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent, and they ate and drank, and carried from it silver and gold and clothing, and they went and hid them. And then they came back and entered another tent, and carried some from there also, and went and hid it. Then they said to one another, what we're doing is not right. This is a day of good news, and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. So they went and called the gatekeepers of the city and told them, saying, We went into the Syrian camp, and surprising, surprisingly, no one was there. Not a human sound, only horses and donkeys tied and their tents intact. Let's move down to just verse 15. And they went after them to the Jordan, and indeed all the road was full of garments and weapons which the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. So the messengers returned and told the king. Then the people went out and plundered the tents of the Syrians. So a seer of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two seers of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Now the king had appointed the officer on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. But the people trampled him in the gate. And he died, just as the man of God had said, who spoke to the king who came down to him. So it happened just as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two seers of barley for a shekel, a sea of fine flour for a shekel, shall be sold tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. Then that officer had answered, that had answered the man of God said, Now look, if the Lord would make the window, windows of heaven, could this, be, could this thing be? And he said, in fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And so it happened, for the people trampled to him, trampled him in the gate, and he died. May God bless you his word this morning. Praise God. You know, as I was preparing this message, I was reminded of a, uh, a story that, that um, uh, I heard many years ago. Uh, and it was on the CNN and uh, the, uh, the news medias. And it was a story about a man called Larry Walker. Anybody heard of Larry Walker? 
Okay. Well, Larry Walker, he was a, uh, an individual living in Los Angeles. And one day, Larry was sitting in the back, uh, his backyard, and he was a bit bored. So he decided, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to get a chair, and I'm going to attach to that chair some helium balloons. And he strapped himself into the chair, and he got a six-pack, and he got some sandwiches, and he took a slug gun, uh, and he cut the rope. And he began to rise uh, from his garden. Uh, he rose 30 feet. He rose 300 feet. He rose 500 feet. He rose 5,000 feet. You see, his plan was he wanted just to hover about maybe 30 feet off the ground. And uh, he took the slug gun. So he thought, well, you know, I'll, when I'm ready to come down, I'll just pop a few balloons and that'll let me, that'll lower me. But of course, when he reached 5,000, uh, he was a bit reluctant to start shooting his, uh, his boat. <laughs> and of course, what happened was the media, this was, he, he drifted across into uh, Los Angeles uh, airport uh, traffic, uh, air traffic. And uh, of course, so there was a bit of an emergency. Uh, all the uh, rescue teams and uh, uh, they were out, and all the news teams were out, and you know, we said, you're never going to believe it, but uh, aircraft had to be diverted. Uh, and after a few hours up in that, that position, he decided, well, I'm going to have to do something, so he began to uh, pop a few balloons. And slowly he began to come down. Unfortunately, he got tangled in some, uh, some power lines and had to be rescued by the, the fire brigade. And of course, he, when he finally got down to Earth, planet Earth, you know, he was greeted by reporters. And the, the question they had is, why did you do it? Why did you do it? And Larry's reply was, a man can't just sit here. A man just can't sit there. Now, Larry Walker will not win any prizes for intelligence. But he's right. You know, we can't just sit here. It's true. And uh, that's the title of my message this morning. You can't just sit there. You can't just sit there. You've got to do something. And, you know, the passage we read, uh, it flows from uh, the message we started last week. And uh, we know that from last week in chapter 6, find Israel has been split in two. It's a divided kingdom. In the northern part of uh, Israel is uh, the city of Samaria, the capital of Samaria and the ten tribes, and uh, in the south we find Judah and, the, uh, uh, and Jerusalem. And because they're weakened uh, by being divided, the enemy has been, been attacking. Those, some of those enemies have come from neighboring uh, people like the uh, Syrians by the, the uh, uh, Moab and Ammon. Uh, Ammon. Uh, others would be further afield from Assyria and Babylon. And last week we talked about, in chapter 6, we see the, the, the siege of Samaria. And we see that King Hadad uh, has uh, tried the second time to try and break uh, Samaria. And uh, this has been going on for some time. And there's a, a severe famine in Samaria. And, uh, you know, so much so that they've resorted to cannibalism and all kinds of things. And it's just a shocking situation. And, uh, of course, we saw there that in the city there was a prophet by the name of Elisha. And Elisha had been a thorn in the flesh to Hadad and the Syrians uh, for many a day. And uh, the king uh, of, of Samaria, basically, when he, he hears about the cannibalism, he tears his, his robes, he begins to just uh, explode with rage, and he says, I'm going to take the head off Elisha. It's his fault. Why hasn't he and his God responded? And so uh, that's where we picked it up. And as he comes to attack Elisha, Elisha's with the, the elders of the city at the city gate. And uh, he, says to the, he says, lock the doors because, you know, the master is coming and his servant. And finally they get in and, they, and Elisha says these words. He says, you know, 
uh, this time tomorrow, there's going to be breakthrough. This time tomorrow, uh, a sea of flour is going to be sold for a shekel. And uh, so he speaks of, you know, God intervening, God's intervention. But the servant of the king, he just uh, basically says, he says, look, even if God opened up the windows of heaven, could this thing be? And Elisha replies, he says, you are going to see it with your eyes. You're going to hear about it but you're not going to taste of it. And so many times, you know, we hear situations where people hear the word of the Lord. They'll hear a prophecy. They'll hear a preach. They'll read something of God. And it's basically, I'm cynical. I'm blasé. I've heard this all before. Be careful. Because there are prom God's promises are yes and amen. God is faithful to his promises. And even when promises are delayed, they're not always denied. Amen? Praise God. And so that's where we pick up the story. And uh, so chapter, chapter 7 and verse 3, we find that there's a slight change of scene. And the focus now turns to People outside of the city walls. And outside of those city walls, outside the place where the, the siege was taking place, there are four lepers. And these four lepers are part of the community, but they're outside of the community. And lepers in those days weren't allowed inside of the, uh, uh, the city. And what would have taken place likely is that their relatives might have come over and they might have dropped them some food every now and again uh, just to keep them uh, fed. And so, but these people are, are actually, they're desperate. If things are bad on the inside, they're worse for them on the outside. They, you know, there's no food to give them. And so, you know, they're, they're in a desperate situation. And uh, uh, so they're victims but they're victims who decide to do something. And they become four men that really become the key to the survival and salvation of that city. These people who were outcasts, these people who were discarded, looked down upon, they're the very ones that end up being the key to the salvation of the city. Hallelujah. And in verse 3, we, be, we see them, they begin to discuss their plight. And, uh, you know, they say in verse 4, they say, if we go into the city, there's famine there, and we're going to die. And then they, they, uh, they, they, they continue, and they say, uh, uh, but, and, uh, and if we sit here, we're going to die also. Therefore, let's come and surrender to the army of the Assyrians. If they keep us alive, then we shall live. If they kill us, we shall die. So, these guys, they've got some choices to make. And I want to talk about just the three choices that they're presented with. And sometimes God puts us in positions where we have to make a choice. We can't just sit there. Okay? We've got to do something. And the first choice that they had, and I call it Sophie's Choice. Do you remember there was a film some years ago and a book written called Sophie's Choice? Uh, Meryl Streep, Streep, I think, was the, the actress in it. And Sophie's choice was this. Sophie's choice is really, it's the choice between two unbearable options. And uh, the essence of, around Sophie's choice was this. She was set in World War II, and, um, you know, there's been a, uh, the Germans are coming in, and there's a, a gonna, they're, they're, they're after the family. And um, there's a, a scene in the, in, the, in, the, in the movie where Sophie, the mother, has to make a choice between one of, her, one of her children. There's the eldest and the youngest. And she has to pick one. Now, no parent would want to be in that situation, choosing either the, the youngest or the eldest. And so she has an unbearable choice to make. And she lives under the guilt of that choice that she's made. And that's known as Sophie's Choice. These guys had Sophie's Choice. 
It's like, okay, if we go into the city, the famine is there and we're going to die. So choice one was to go into the city. But the city, what, what did the city offer? It offered starvation and it offered famine. So that's not a choice. Um, and, uh, you know, so uh, it offered a certain death. Uh, they said here, if we go into the city, the famine is there. And if we enter the city, we're going to die. That's, that's the, tr the unbearable choice that they've got to choose. Neither one of them is a, a solution. And, of course, it speaks to us of, of the city. The city is a picture of the world. And when we consider the world today and what it has to offer us in terms of life, in terms of fulfillment, in times of purpose, the city, the world, is a place of death and hopelessness. Nothing lasting, nothing of value to those that are in need. Sure, the city has great cultural centers. It has great museums, art museums. It has great institutions, great religious shrines. But those don't really meet the need that humanity has. Humanity needs connection. It needs purpose. It needs provision. And those things don't provide that. Hallelujah. All that the world offers is temporary. I mean, those of us, and I've said this before, if we're looking to the government to help, if we're looking to the government to meet our need, if we're looking to material things, money, to meet our needs, we're looking in the wrong place. We're going to come up short. The solution is always Jesus. Always Jesus. I've said this before, but you know, every problem we have in life has to do with people. And you know, there's we're body, soul, and spirit. And basically, all your problems have a spiritual component in it. All your problems have a emotional, behavioral component to it. And sometimes there's a physical component to it. But ultimately, what happens spiritually will affect you emotionally. What affects you emotionally will have a, an impact on you physically. But so often, the world offers the physical. They might offer the therapeutic, psychological, behavioral. But the world can't offer the spiritual. Only Jesus can offer the spiritual. And it's only when we start with Jesus that really things get healed completely. Hallelujah. What the world offers is band-aid upon band-aid upon band-aid. Some of those things are good, but they're not lasting. And I say that uh, from years of experience as both a pastor and also a social worker. I mean, many a time we would have seen a situation where, you know, there would be a, a family who was homeless or helpless, powerless. And the government's answer was, we'll relocate them and we'll put them in a new home. And that, that happened. But all that happened was all the family issues, all the pain, all the history just got relocated. And there'd be a honeymoon period, but ultimately within the space of maybe two or three months, the new space was worse than the old place. And so, you know, this is the, the, the wisdom of the world. It's, it's, it simply is temporary. Temporary upon temporary. And the word of God says in Matthew 24, it says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not shall stand forever. Uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. Hallelujah. Praise his name. See, what God says, what God determines, what God has purposed for your life, that's what's going to sustain you through thick and thin. That's what's not going to let you down. Man will let you down. Governments will let you down. Other 
finances, all those material things are going to leave you empty. But God will never let you down. Praise his name. The, the city, and for these lepers, the city was incapable of providing life. It only provided more famine, more uh, and, and potential death. Um, and again, we noticed the response from the king. When those two ladies came to him and said you know, they'd resorted to cannibalism, and uh, the king, as he ripped his, his robe just out of just sheer consternation and shock and frustration, and he says, where, 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 if it doesn't come from God, if your help does not come from God, where is it going to come from? Is it going to come from the wine press? Is it going to come from the threshing floor? It's just not there. You're looking in the wrong place. Praise God. And so that was the first choice that the, the lepers had. The choice, first choice was to enter the city. It was Sophie's choice. The only choice they had was death or, or starvation. And that, so there wa that wasn't a choice. The second choice they had was to stay where they are. Stay put. And that's not much of a choice either. See, they were lepers. They had already contact contracted a fatal disease. Uh, uh, leprosy is a type of skin disease that it slowly degenerates and creeps into the body and various limbs begin to fall, fall off. Their disease would eat their life away. And nothing, uh, and would do nothing, uh, but, but meant nothing than, than just death again and starvation. But what happened is, is their plight had brought them to their senses. And they said, if we stay here, if we don't do something, if we don't move, we're going to die. And if for some of you, as I said, there are, that's exactly where you're at. You need to do something. We shared in the conference there just over this last week about Peter and the boat. You see, the miracles of God only happen in the context of risk. You don't see God's provision. You don't see God moving on your behalf outside of risk. And if you remember there's the story of Peter in the boat, Matthew chapter 14. Jesus comes to them walking on the water. And as Jesus comes, the 11, uh, 12 disciples are in that boat. And they're struggling because there's a storm. There's a circumstance. There's a problem. There's a difficulty. There's a, an issue that they have to deal with. And they're trying to row against the forces of nature. They're trying in their own understanding, in their own experience, in their own strength to battle the storm. And they're struggling. Now this is compounded by a ghost, or what they perceive to be a ghost. This is out of their experience. This is out of the box. And suddenly they see Jesus surfing on the waves. <laughs> and their, their, their reaction is one of fear. And Peter sort of flops it out. He says, if it's you, Lord, if it's you, Lord, bid me come to you in the water. And Jesus speaks his word. And he simply says, come, come. You see, Peter didn't walk on water. He walked on the word of God. And so Peter stood up in the boat. That's the first thing he did. You've got to stand up. See, the boat represented all Peter's securities, all his ex life's experience. He was a fisherman. He knew the boat. He knew that inside the boat he was safe. He was secure. But he stood up in the boat. And at some point in time, he stood on the ledge of the boat. Hallelujah. I shared a, there, you know, there's three components of your miracle. First is God's word. That's 98% of your miracle. Hallelujah, it's God's word. He was the word made flesh. He dwelt amongst us. When Jesus spoke, things happened. His words are words of eternal life. They're the things that are going to sustain you. They're the things that are going to direct you. They're the things that are going to heal you. 
Praise God. That's why it's so important to read, understand, digest the Word of God. It's not just to feed your intellect. It's to feed your soul. And when you have that in your soul, it brings wisdom. It brings vitality to your life. It brings direction to your life. It brings healing to your life. Praise His name. But that's only 98%. 1% is your faith. The Bible says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you shall speak to this mountain and it will be moved. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll say to this mulberry bush, be uprooted and cast into the sea. Hallelujah. 1% is your faith. You see, you don't need big faith. You, know, you, you only need to use the little faith that you have. Hallelujah. But the clincher is this. The last percent is obedience. You see, you can have the Word. You can know the Word. You can be up to here with the Word. And you can have, you can believe the Word. But the thing that activates it is obedience. Hallelujah. You see, Peter, if Peter had remained in the boats, there'd be no miracle. You can't just sit there and do nothing. When you hear the Word of God, you've got to do something. You've got to respond. You can't just sit there. And that, unfortunately, friends, is the Western church. That, my friends, is so many Christians. They know the word. They've heard the sermons. They're blasé about it. They're cynical about it. Because they haven't walked in it. Hallelujah. God wants to release miracles in your life. But he's only going to release it as you allow God's word to go into your spirit. As you take the faith that you have and believe it, but to act upon it. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise His name. Praise His name. So they couldn't just sit there. They had to do something. And they said, if we stay here, we're going to die. And then the third choice is to surrender to the army and take their chances. Again, verse, uh, verse 4. It says, now therefore... Come, let us surrender to the armies of the, the Syrians. If they keep us alive, well, we shall live. If they kill us, well, we're going to die. That's the best choice. They've got a 50-50 choice there of success. Hallelujah. And so that's Hobson's choice. So we have Sophie's choice, no choice, and Hobson's choice. And Hobson's choice is a free choice, but there's only one option. It's a take it or leave it option. It's a yes or no option. Hallelujah. And so, you know, God presents us with often Hobson's choices. You have the flesh or the spirit. You have God's way or your way or man's way. You look to God or you look to man. You know, there's only one way, and that's to Jesus. They only had one way, and that was to the Assyrians. We have only one way, and that is Christ. Amen. He is the way the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but through Him. Hallelujah. And God will often maneuver circumstances to bring us to that place. And that's what we do when we come to the, the, the communion table. That's, when we, that's what happens when we come to the cross. Hallelujah. Watch. There's our way or God's way. Hallelujah. There's one side of the cross and there's God's side of the cross. Praise His name. Hallelujah. Praise his name. So they decide to do something. These four men. And so they, they come to the Syrian camp. And again, just my little imagination allows me to give me a bit of liberty here. But, you know, they're, they're, they're probably a little bit fearful and a little bit tense as they're approaching the camp of this, this army. And, you know, they're probably... <laughs> They're probably trying to get there as 
quietly and as anonymously as they could. And then they arrive, and they, they arrive in the, in the tent, and they, they, they peer into the tent, and of course, there's no noise of any Assyrians. Everybody's, oh, they must be sleeping. And of course, they move, and there's food, there's uh, wealth, there's everything that they, they need. And, and, and so they, they, they come in, and they begin to, to take as much as they can out of the first tent, and they go, and they, we better go and hide this. So they bury the food and bury the, the wealth. And they go back into the second tent and they do the same. And you see, what did they find when they went to the, the, the Syrian camp? First thing they found was that there was no enemy. That the thing that they feared most was actually not there. The second thing that they found was they found that there was life there. There was the potential that they could live in that camp. The third thing was they found the food that, that, that would sustain them. And the third thing they found was, was provision, was wealth. Hallelujah. And what will we find when we take that step of faith and follow God's leading? We'll find that firstly God is a God who doesn't judge us. Hallelujah. We'll find an enemy who's defeated. And we'll find a friend that will help us. We'll find great wealth of peace and hope and security and love. Hallelujah. See, he is the one who has the words of eternal life. The disciples had the opportunity to leave Jesus. John chapter 6. Jesus had said some harsh words. And a lot of his disciples stopped following him. And he turns to the disciple, are you going to follow them? And he says, no, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Praise in his name. Hallelujah. So we find all that we need. We're complete in Christ. Hallelujah. That's what we find in Jesus. But then we see in the story that they find themselves. And I suppose just the conviction of God comes upon them. And they said in verse 9, it says there, they said to one another, we're not doing right. This is a day of good news, and we remain silent. If we wait till the morning, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, let us come and go and tell the king's household. Hallelujah. You see, when Christ comes into your life, when hope comes into your life, when solutions to your family, to your friends, your neighbors comes, how can we be silent? How can we just keep that to ourselves? We don't do right if we don't tell. Amen? Hallelujah. Five declarations that the lepers make. It says, what we're doing isn't good. Amen? We've all been given the ministry of reconciliation. Every one of you. Every one of you. Every one of you. Every one of you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. That is not limited just to the pastor. That's not limited just to the evangelist. That's everybody who believes. No matter how old, no matter how long, you are in Christ. We have an obligation to share what we've received. Amen. Hallelujah. He says, this is a day of good news. The world has bad news. I mean, look at it. Brexit. Even the All Blacks lost last yesterday. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's, that's a disaster. <laughs> Trump and all, what's happening in the United States. I mean, the world is in a, a terrible mess. Uncertainty. It doesn't have the answers. And we just see it just imploding. Family breakups. You know, it, it, is, it is. They say things have progressed. I don't see it. But what I do see is that we have a, a message of hope and of good news. We can't remain silent. 
It's the third thing they said. Else we'd be guilty. Let's go now. Let's do something. Amen. Let's do something. I was going to finish here. Matthew chapter 10, verses 7 and 8. It says, as you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Hallelujah. How many have got hands? Okay. The Bible says if you lay hands on the sick, they're going to be blessed. They're going to be healed. They're going to be delivered. Hallelujah. That's one of the fundamental foundational truths of the Christian life. Amen. How many, when was the last time you laid hands on somebody? Amen. Do it. Just don't sit there. Do it. Take a risk and see what God will do through you. Hallelujah. Praise His name. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Okay, how many have raised the dead? Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you, you, you feel like that in a congregation, but not, not this one. Praise God. <laughs> Cleanse those who have left. Receive. Drive out demons. Amen. It says here, it finishes off, it says, freely received, freely give. Amen. What you hear, what you receive, what you're blessed with, God wants you to pass that on. You are blessed to be a blessing. Hallelujah. That blessing isn't just to be sat upon. It's not just to end with you. It is for you. It is for future generations. Amen. Amen. It is for our community. Let's just pray. Hallelujah. So, Father, I just thank you this morning that you're a God of action. And faith, Lord, is a verb. It's not a noun. It's a doing word. So, Father, I pray, Lord, Lord my God, those things that you've imparted to us, those things that you've given to us, O oh God, those privileges, Lord, those graces, those gifts, all the things that you've imparted to us, O oh God, I pray, Lord, Lord my God, for release. I pray, Lord, for faith to rise up within us, O oh God. But, Lord, more than faith, I pray for courage to take the risk, to take the step. And Lord, my God, I pray, Lord, for, Lord, your miraculous, supernatural provision to kick in. I pray, Lord, for those prophecies that have gone over our lives, oh God. And Lord, my God, those things are yet to be, Lord, but we have to respond. We have to do something. So, Lord, will you put a bomb under us? Will you shake us? Will you move us into action, O oh God? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Praise God. Praise God.